<laughs> Good morning, church. It is June and it is warm. And it's great to have you with us today in person or some of you watching this online. Uh, just a couple things uh, that are going to be happening uh, this week. One is Tuesday night at 7 o'clock and have a board meeting. And I know that gets people excited. Um, but one of the things we're talking about this week on Tuesday night is uh, the future of uh, our pastoral uh, leadership here. Because a year ago, we agreed to, uh, Allie and I, share the pastor position for a year. And that year's ending on June 30th, so we're going to be discussing that, among other things. So if you want to have an input on that or want to know what's going on with that, again, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock in the church. Also today, and we announced this last week, we didn't have all the information. Uh, this is Nancy Mercer's service today, her funeral service. It's going to be a done quickly. There's two of those, one in Stowe, one in Akron. If you go to the one in Stowe, you'll be disappointed. Um, but in Akron, 2 to 5 is visiting our services at 5. Uh, those are some of the things happening in the life of our church. It's a great day to worship God. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. God, we are so grateful, so grateful to be able to worship you, whether we're uh, worshiping online today or in person. We know that where two or three are gathered, you're in our midst, so we know you're here. And it is a wonderful June day in Northeast Ohio, a day that puts a smile on our faces, and also being in worship makes us smile as well. So thank you for this day. Uh, this is a day that you've made, and we are going to rejoice, and we are glad in it. Amen. In terms of offering, I'm going to share this information that um, I think it's later today, about 10 o'clock, we have a group of people meeting to discuss the outreach project we're going to be doing to, uh, to in support of young pregnant women helping to get baby supplies for them and everything. And the Secret Sisters agreed to do this a while ago, but we've just been waiting to get the details. Um, so they're meeting today at 10 o'clock, and it's going to be a great way to support people in need. So you'll hear, be hearing more about that later. Uh, if you have a financial gift to give to the church, that's great as well. And you can either do that in person, you can do that by uh, Giblify, you can do that by dropping off a check. But as always, we are so grateful Grateful for all your support of our church. Thanks. We're starting a new sermon series today that we're going to be doing all summer long. And it's a sermon series on the parables. And there are a lot of parables. And we're not going to cover them all. However, we've kind of uh, divvied them up a little bit. But if there's a particular parable that you just think is important, that is meaningful to you, and you're not sure whether or not we're going to look at it, feel free to let us know. And uh, I know that Allie's probably got most of her sermons written for the whole summer, right? Most of them, not all of them. Um, but if you have one in particular that you really like, that you wish we'd spend some time with, just let us know. I know what we're doing, uh, we've got the month of June already marked off. We have other months kind of with things penciled in. But if you've got one that's important to you, just let us know. Again, this is what we're doing June, July, and August. Well, years ago, we rented a... Uh, Beachside house for two weeks at the Outer Banks. And that was just a wonderful vacation. And it was a while ago because the grandkids hadn't been born yet. And of course, all the houses at the Outer Banks are cool. And every time we drive by one, we'd say, oh, I wish we owned that one, or wish we owned that one. But this particular uh, house at the Outer Banks had this really noteworthy feature that we just enjoyed because it had an upper room. It was kind of like a tower that was above the rest of the house. And if you've ever been to Cal and Laddie's house, you know they had that circular uh, staircase that had that going up to this tower. And once you got up to the upper room, you could see far in any direction. Since this particular room was higher than any of the other houses, and uh, there were windows all the way around the outside. I guess it was kind of like almost being in a lighthouse. And if you were there at the right time in the morning, and I always get up early, and you look towards the east, you could see the sunrise coming up over the ocean. If you're there at the right time in the evening and looked in the opposite direction, that's kind of like to the, to the bay side, then you'd see the sun setting. So was this room a great location for seeing the sunrise? Absolutely. Was this room a great location for seeing the sun set? Absolutely. Both observations, though seemingly contradictory, were true. It all depended on your perspective what direction you were facing, what time you were there. 
And I thought about the upper room this week, the upper room that is in, on the Outer Banks, as I was working on today's message. And again, as I said, uh, Allie and I are going to be doing this sermon series, and it's kind of the working title is Those Powerful and Puzzling Parables. In most of these parables, if not all of them, the meaning depends upon how you look at it, depends upon your perspective. And many of them have surprising endings, especially if we haven't heard them before. It's going to be tricky because most of us have heard of many of these and we're less likely to be surprised. But certainly to the audience at the time, the first time that people heard Jesus say these, so many times they were shocking. For example, the Good Samaritan story, we know part of the shock of that story is that this, and you're doing the Good Samaritan next week? Yes. So that's coming next week, Good Samaritan. <laughs> uh, it would have been a shocking thing. It's not as shocking to us because we just assume that the Samaritan's a good guy. But at that time, it would have been a surprising thing. And then after that, starting on Father's Day, we're doing the prodigal son. And again, here's this wasteful son. He does all the wrong stuff. He comes back, and they're happy to see him. They throw a party for him. Or you get those bridesmaids, and their, their number one uh, issue is they didn't bring enough oil, and they get shut out of the wedding. Now, we can try to soften the rough edge of these stories. We can try to make them sound like happier versions of themselves. But I'm sure it was the intention of Jesus not to make us happy. I don't think he wanted to make us unhappy, but he wanted to get us riled up. He wanted these stories to bother us and upset us and look at things from a new perspective, a new way. Now, this past week, I was invited to, to do something that, unfortunately, I had to say no to. I was asked to be on the Faculty of Advanced Conference, that's our summer program for those in their 20s. And that's one of the weeks we're going to be on vacation and up in Michigan. I just didn't see how I could be in both places at the same time. But as I thought about being at Advanced Conference, uh, not this summer, but maybe some future years, I remember what a fellow Advanced Faculty member once said to me, and I think she was trying to be critical of me, but I took it as a compliment. She said, Jim, your keynotes are always so provocative. And I think she was saying, not a lot of content, you just got people upset. And she was right. Because invariably when I got in front of these 20-year-olds, I wanted to upset them. I wanted to provoke them. I wanted them to get to look at things in a new way. In fact, if I would have gone up there and they said, Jim, you're right, we agree with you 100%, I would have quit on the spot. In fact, one year the address was in the Camp Christian gym. And just because I knew it would upset people, because we had a no smoking policy at camp, I pulled out a cigar and lit it, knowing that people would be shocked and appalled and then we could go on to our real purpose. Well, I think that's kind of what Jesus does with parables. He wants to make people uncomfortable. I'm not saying he would have lit a cigar, but he doesn't always wrap it up. He doesn't always give people a happy ending. He wants them to look at their lives in a new way. And this thing that Jesus wanted them to look at their lives in, in view of, he called the kingdom of God. And he didn't want them to confuse the kingdom of God with the kingdom of Rome or the Roman Empire. He wanted them to look at it differently. And a couple thousand years later, I think the stories are intended to do the same thing. They're supposed to upset us. Now, I'm not going to take out a cigar today, as much as you might suggest that I would. But we're supposed to get a little bit riled up today. These stories are supposed to bother us. And I think they will. Now, today's parable, the one that we're leading off the series with, it's called the uh, Parable of the Talents. And if you know your Bible, you know there's two versions of this. One is in Luke and one is in Matthew. And the facts are a little bit differently. And this kind of stuff used to bug me. And to, that, you know how certain parts of the Bible, one story would be one way, one would be another. Uh, and then I re read something. I said, no, that's got to be true. This person who was writing about a commentary in the New Testament said, Jesus told these stories many times. He was in one village, he told it, he'd tell the same story in another village, because these are good stories. It's not as if Jesus only took, uh, told these stories once, he told them many times. And in different situations, maybe he just changed the facts. They're his stories, he can tell them any way he wants to. So today we're not looking at the one from Luke, we're looking at the one from Matthew. And again, a lot of you know this, and if you don't, and you have time to stop this, you're at home. We're at Matthew 25, starting on verse 14. Again, often called the parable of the talents. It goes like this. For it is as if a man going on a journey 
summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these servants came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. Here are five talents more. The master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the same thing happened with the two-talent guy. He said, I went out and I traded it and I made two talents more. Same words from the master. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in many things, or a few things that will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. But this is where the story takes the turn. The one who had received the one talent came in. He said, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. I was afraid. So I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, yeah, it's getting bad. You wicked and lazy servant. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and I gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have more will be given. And they, have, and they will have an abundance. But for those who have nothing, even when what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless servant, throw him into the utter darkness. And this is my son, one of my son Jacob's favorite parts of the Bible. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It doesn't sound good, does it? So quick question, how does this parable, especially the ending, make you feel? Does it make you feel warm and fuzzy or a bit nervous? And what about that servant who hit that talent in the ground and got thrown out into the weeping and gnashing of teeth place? Do you think he got what he deserved? Or do you feel like he was mistreated? Doesn't it all depend on your perspective? Let's say you're the investor. Let's say you have some money and uh, you want to use it for your retirement or maybe you're setting aside a college fund for kids or grandkids or whatever you would, maybe you want to invest your money wisely. So there's three companies and you give a big chunk of it to one company, you give a little bit less to a second company, third company, you're not too sure about them, but you give them something. So you spread your wealth among these three companies and uh, this is before uh, quicker te technology. You don't get to look at it on online, but after a time, I don't know if it's a year or two or whatever, you meet with them. And you meet with the first company that you gave a big chunk of your wealth to, and you say, how'd you do with my money? Oh, I doubled your money. You'd be so happy. Right? You'd be so happy. And you go, okay, this is great. I'm going to get you some more money. And then let's say that other company, the one you invested a chunk in, not as much, and let's say they said, we doubled your money, Reverend Bain. Fantastic. Now you have $200. You used to have 100 right? We don't have that much to invest. And you go, okay, good. I'm making more money. But then the third company comes in. They said, you know what? We knew this was going to be a bad year in the stock market. We weren't sure what to do with your money. So we just put it in the bank. Well, actually, we put it in our safe. It didn't even go in the bank. Here it is. Here's your 50 bucks. You would not be happy. You'd say, give me that money back. Get out of here. I'm going to give this to somebody that's going to grow this money into something. So if we're looking at this story from the perspective of the investor, the master, whatever you want to call yourself, it makes a lot of sense. First two servants did well. The guy's happy. But that third servant, he mismanaged the money. He didn't grow it at all. He kept the original investment. You're not going to employ him. From the vantage point of the investor or the master, it all makes sense that that guy gets the boot. 
It seems reasonable because you have money that's invested. You want it to make money, don't you? So from the perspective of the investor, this story is all good. It all makes sense. Reward people that make you money. Get rid of people that don't. But how often do we look at this story from the perspective of the servants? How many of us see ourselves as the servants rather than the investor or master? And if you identify yourselves with the servants, which one reminds you of you? Which one do you see yourself in? Are you the five talent one who goes out and doubles the investment? Are you the two talent one who doubles the investment? Are you kind of that one talent guy? If you're a five talent person, a two talent person, you think you're in a pretty good relationship with the master. He's going to be happy when you give an accounting. But I think a lot of us, we gravitate to that one talent guy. And we hear this story as judgment. Because we're afraid we haven't been as successful as we should have been. We dread the meeting with the investor. We suspect it isn't going to go well. If we see ourselves as the one talent servant, then this is not going to be one of our favorite parables, is it? And what is the, if you're the one talent servant who gets the boot weeping of gnashing of teeth, you know what parable you really hate? What parable you really hate? The prodigal son. Because the prodigal son, he doesn't just bury the talent and give it back to his dad. He takes his share of the inheritance, and again, getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, he blows it on wasteful living. He spends it on himself. And his older brother even says he spends it on prostitutes. So what happens to the prodigal son? Anybody remember? He comes home and they say, yes! Now he's supposed to be thrown into the weeping and gnashing of teeth place, but the dad, who has had to sacrifice as well, gives him a big hug and says, woo, you're back. Let's have a party. So if you're the one talent guy, and you even brought back the original talent to the master, and you get thrown into the weeping and gnashing of teeth place, you're going to look at that prodigal son and go, wait a minute. Apparently, I should have wasted the money. Apparently, I should have done all this hard living because that guy gets rewarded. I get punished. I get punished because I was afraid. You might say to yourself, what is this kingdom of God like anyway? When me, I, my biggest uh, crime was just being afraid, I get punished while the disobedient son gets rewarded. And that's why these stories bother us. That's why they provoke us. We just don't like it. They make us nervous. And regardless of your vantage point, whether you're looking from one direction to the other, regardless of them, regardless of who we identify with, there's going to be issues here. For example, and we're coming back to where we were a minute ago. Let's say you see yourself as the investor. You gotta get used to the fact that when you pass out your uh, investments, when you get other people to handle them, they don't always do it very well, do they? And one thing I think is so important about this story is the master didn't say, well, uh, Ali, I want you to spend it on this. I want you to invest. We were having a conversation with my nephew yesterday who has been investing stocks he was going, Whirlpool. I'm like, what? He goes, Whirlpool. People are buying houses. People are putting additions on. People are buying appliances. Whirlpool. I'm like, okay. Apparently, i got to go buy Whirlpool, right? But what happens when you invest in others? What happens when you invest in different companies or different people? Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. And what about those of us who invest in our children? Do our kids always make good uh, investment decisions? I know everybody over here, this, these guys always make good choices, right? <laughs> but isn't it true we invest in our kids and they don't always make good choices? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but we give it to them anyway. So if you're the investor, if you're the investor, you've got to have a little bit of freedom, right? You've got to be willing to let things turn out the way they're going to turn out. And sometimes our kids are going to make better decisions than we would. Whirlpool, by the way, you heard it here. <laughs> so if you're the investor, part of this story is complicated. But if you're the five-talent servant or the two-talent servant, it's not without complications either. Some of you probably know the scripture. It's in Luke 12. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. 
And for the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. In other words, if you've got a lot in your life, and you might, if you've got a lot in your life, a lot of blessings, don't be self-satisfied. Don't be smug. Don't go, I deserve it. Instead, know that if you've got a lot, you've got a lot to share. You've got a lot of responsibility. If you've been gifted with a lot of good things, you've got to share with others. That's not easy. And then if you're that one-talent servant guy, I think the most important thing from this lesson is this. Do not live in fear. Because that's the biggest, the biggest bad thing about this uh, story, right? The biggest lesson is don't live in fear. That this is all about, in the end, taking risks. The investor risks, the five-talent guy, uh, guy risks, the two-talent guy risks. But the one-talent person, he's criticized because he doesn't take a risk at all. He just buries it, right? He's stingy. And here's what's, again, one of those things that gets lost in that story. Uh, we forget how much, because it's not a word we use in this way. But even the one-talent servant person, that talent is worth years and years of income. So he was given a lot. Now, you know what? I don't know how you approach it, but I, we used to say this to our kids in Hudson. We said, there's always kids in this town who are going to have more than you. You know, or got that new car for graduation or whatever. And if you're looking at other kids, other kids in this town are going to have more than you. But you've got a lot. So if you've got one talent, you've got a lot. And we can spend all our time going, I wish I had more. I wish my situation was different. I wish life had turned out this way. Okay, good luck with that. But don't ever forget how much God's given you. And sometimes uh, God gives us a nudge. Sometimes God gives us an opportunity. But God always gives you free will to invest your life how you want. And one more thing. Think regardless of who you identify with, whether the investor, the five talent, two talent, one talent, I think a big part of this involves an orientation of abundance and sharing. Because what does the investor do? The investor could have kept all his money together, but instead he shares. And he doesn't know what's going to happen, but he's got an abundant reason. He shares with the five talent, two talent, one talent. He puts his money out there and he takes the risk. And he is confident that it'll come back. The five-talent, two-talent guy, they go out once, they take a risk. They have a sense of abundance. And there's only one guy that doesn't take a risk in this story. That's the one-talent guy. He doesn't trust. He, instead, what does he do? He hoards that one thing. So one of the things at the core of this parable is whether we trust in God. Do we trust that God is going to give in abundance? And I think this... Uh, Awareness is not meant to make us comfortable, but confident. So it always comes back to some version of this. Is today's parable good news for you or bad news for you? Doesn't it depend upon your perspective? Doesn't it depend upon your point of view, which direction you're looking in, which phase of life you're in? Do you think there's more than enough to go around? And that because you have so much, you can be generous, that you can share. Do you believe that God's always going to provide for you abundantly? Or do you think there's not much there? I better cling to what I've got. Are you a generous person? Or are you a stingy person? Are you motivated more by trust or by fear? Now, if you're at least a little bit bothered today, then Jesus has done his job. And next week, we're going to do it again with a new parable. Amen. So we uh, go to the most important part of worship, which we're just really blessed to have. Because it's a reminder, again, in this case, Jesus and his gifts to us. Jesus gives it to us abundantly. Jesus even gave his life for us. And uh, if you're at home, this is the chance to pause this and go get your community elements. Otherwise, you have this fantastic high-tech thing here, right? But as we prepare for uh, the Lord's Supper, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this. Remember to me. So take the bread. There it is. And Jesus also took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out to forgive your sins. Let us take that now. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. God, we confess that we often focus on the things we don't have rather than the things we do have. It is so easy to look at others and think, why don't I have what they have? It's so easy to not see abundance. But today, Lord, we ask that you have us look at it in a new way, from a new perspective, a new direction. That we just realize how much you've given us. What tremendous blessings, even the blessing of life itself. Help us to live our lives not in fear, but in faith. Not stingy, but generous. Help us to share what we've got, God, because we know that is your will for us, and that's what builds community by sharing and loving each other. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace.